Okay, well, while that warms up, which it seems to be doing right now, um, yeah, my name is Ashley Milsed. I uh, work at the AWS Center for Quantum Computing. And there it is. So that's, oh, the right. Okay. Ah, oh, good. Okay. Didn't have the same problem from before. So I work at the AWS Center for Quantum Computing, uh, which is in Pasadena, California at Caltech. Um, it's um, at the same location, it's not part of Caltech. But it's nice being close by. Okay. Oh boy. Yeah, I think uh, my laptop has changed its mind. Okay, here we go. So um, I'm going to talk about, um, well, the title is Convenient Time Dependency in Quantum Optics.jl, but really this is kind of more of a, a bit of an, an advertisement for Quantum Optics as a package and also for the kind of stuff that we are interested in doing um, at the AWS CQC. Um, and some new features that we added to uh, that package recently. So this is a picture of our location in Pasadena. Looks a bit different around here. It's a little drier at the moment. Um, why do we use Julia at the Center for Quantum Computing? Well, it's mainly for doing like simulations related to developing quantum devices. So we want to understand how these devices work and how to optimize them and so on. And so we, we, we like to have good performance in these simulations, especially when the quantum systems get a bit larger. We like the composability of Julia because it enables us to move pretty fast with the development of these tools. Um, we like the community and the ecosystem. It's pretty easy to get assistance if uh, we do encounter an issue. Um, Julia Slack is a great place to be. <laughs> um, and uh, of course, the, the SciML ecosystem is pretty awesome and it's nice to be able to access that easily. Um, so quantumoptics.jl. What is it? It's, uh, it's a tool, uh, a very general tool, originally developed by uh, Helmut Rich, his group at the University of Innsbruck, Universität Innsbruck um, in Austria. And it's recently been sort of, you know, it's been around for a while now, but it's been growing and it's been attracting new users and contributors recently. Um, it's a general tool, as I mentioned. You can use it to describe and simulate pretty general quantum systems, both discrete and continuous. So that's like discrete levels or continuous systems like light fields or uh, you know, uh, uh, oscillators um, and everything in between. It's got a convenient sort of blackboard, mathy syntax, or whiteboard if you prefer, mathy syntax. Um, you can use pretty much any operator representation or state representation you like because of the flexibility of like, multiple dispatch in Julia. So, dense, lazy uh, representations of operators, sparse matrices, of course. Um, it's kind of like Qtip, in case you're familiar with that, which is a Python package that has similar goals and aims, but it's, of course, a little more Julian. So it, uh, uh, it's a lot easier to, for example, make it fast than it was for Qtip, who had to jump through quite a few hoops to get good performance. Um, so to give you a, a feel for it, here's a very simple program. We use the package. We define a basis for our quantum system. Here, it's a combination of a FOC basis and a spin basis. We define some operators, a destruction or annihilation operator, a Pauli Z operator, or Z, um, a sigma plus and minus. These are just operators you can use to define your quantum system. Um, we define a composite system using a tensor product notation, and we can embed all those operators into this larger Hilbert space. Uh, to describe this composite system of now maybe a, a resonator and a two-level system, like an atom, something like this. And then we define the Hamiltonian H. We always use H, of course. So there's the Hamiltonian for the system. And it's very simple. It looks like what you'd write on a blackboard, more or less. Um, but of course, you can do efficient simulations with it. Uh, for example, you can compute the eigenvalues um, of this Hamiltonian, which is often something we're interested in, find out what the energy gaps in the system are like. Um, now, uh, what I want to do today is talk about uh, convenient time dependence in these systems. So when we define a Hamiltonian for a system that we control, that we're building ourselves and that we control somehow, we uh, often do that by introducing time dependent terms in the Hamiltonian to do a dynamical simulation. So this might represent, say, a laser being shot at your system or, uh, or a microwave signal being sent in to your processor. Um, so that shows up as a time-dependent term in the Hamiltonian, and the new feature I wanted to talk about, it's something that Qtip has actually had for a while, <laughs> but quantumoptics.jl hasn't, is a convenient way of representing and abstracting these time-dependent terms. So you can see here with H drive, 
we are constructing um, a term with a time-dependent coefficient, which is just the cosine of time in this case. So we put in a function. It's the coefficient for the operator on the right, which is a1 dagger plus a1, or a1 adjoint plus a1. And um, we can compose that with the static Hamiltonian just by summing. It's very simple, very intuitive. Uh, the result is a time-dependent sum also, uh, because this is sort of a lazy sum structure where you have terms and the coefficients can be functions or constants. That's just, it's a very simple thing. Um, so the Hamiltonian uh, or any operator of this form looks like this. You have a sum over some coefficients c. These can be dependent on time. And then you have some static operators inside. Now, there's actually a general interface which allows you to have other types of time dependence. Like if you had something more complicated, maybe this h is also element-wise time dependent or something like that. You can use the general interface to represent that too. Um, so, you know, what can you do with this? Once you have the Hamiltonian, you can just feed it to one of the standard time evolution functions, like the Schrodinger evolution function here. You create an initial state. You say from from where, uh, from when, and to when you'd like to simulate, and you get some result. And um, just to prove that it kind of works in a screenshot, um, we have here an example of showing that the occupation number of the resonator mode here starts at zero and goes up to 1.26 something by the end of the evolution. And the entanglement entropy, everyone likes entanglement, right? Uh, starts at zero and goes up to some non-zero value. We've created entanglement. Isn't that amazing? But it's obviously only in simulation. Um, so just to summarize, these are um, neat little operators. You can construct them in a variety of convenient ways. Here's sort of a vector construction syntax. Um, you can compose them very simply to construct more complicated time-dependent systems. This is something that's actually really important for us because we like to be able to construct uh, models using general code um, for a variety of quantum devices. And if you want to like, write general code to do that, it's really hard unless you have some way of like, encapsulating the different time-dependent terms you want to put together in the end. And it's efficient. So um, unsurprisingly, in Julia, we demand it has to be fast. So if you uh, update the time value of these operators, you don't get any allocations. This means, like for small system simulations um, that we quite often do, where there's fast time dependence, so the integrator is calling the objective function many, many, many times for a simulation, thousands, hundreds of thousands of times perhaps, it's really important that we don't do anything slow, like do any runtime dispatch or allocate in this situation. So we make sure we don't do that. Um, so. That's not the only cool new thing that's come into quantum optics recently. Um, recently, um, uh, contributors split out uh, quantuminterface.jl, which is a common interface layer that other packages can use to provide um, you know, other functionality, but using the same general interface of bases and states and operators and so on. We've ha we have lazier, lazy operators than we had before, which is nice because lazy operators are nice ways of efficiently representing like, larger, more complicated systems. Um, and you can put them into some concrete form later. Usually that's the slow part, so you don't want to do it all the time. And uh, faster, dense, lazy tensor products. And if you don't know what that means, don't worry. But um, you know that was something that was quite interesting for us early on. And we've integrated CryoKit and Fast uh, XPM recently uh, for uh, like, yeah, uh, solving eigenvalue problems and integration. Are we about done? Yeah. So contributions are welcome, of course. There are things to do. And with that, thank you very much. <laughs>